Ali and Mason, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? We're doing well. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. I'm I'm very excited to have you on. You're actually the first streamer uh, that I'm having on the, on the show. Uh, so first of its kind, unique story. Let's just jump into it, okay? Uh, both of you guys, what a pleasure to have uh, each of you. Even though we're talking about Ali, obviously there's a team behind Ali, right? Mason, you, from what I understood, you're, you're very hands-on. You're very in that process of building and managing, right? And Ali's very much on the front end and, and doing all all the, the beautiful things that come in the front, right? That's how I understood it based off what Ali was telling me, right? Is that the dynamic? Yeah, it's funny that you said front end because I always say like Ali's the front end and I'm the back end. So yeah. I'm like behind the scenes doing managerial stuff and Ali is just like the face of everything and has the personality. Yeah. I, I mean, both very into cryptocurrency, obviously, but Mason's definitely more on the technical expertise. So the two of us together, we make a really good team. And uh, that's come about through Alicoin. Give me give me a quick background, both on on yourselves, right? So, Ali, for you, how did you get started becoming a Twitch streamer, right? And just a streamer in general, uh, and more of that gaming personality and the following that you've got. How did you kind of get started with that path? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, that's a good example of how ingrained you know Mason has been to every step of the process because it was actually. Mason and his friends that introduced me to this game called Hearthstone. So it's a card game. It's the card game version of World of Warcraft, if you're familiar with Blizzard and WoW. So I started playing Hearthstone in 2014. And then Mason and his friends said, hey, you you should stream. Um, and I was like, well, I don't even know what streaming and Twitch is. So, you know, I always liked the idea of entertaining people and doing something a little unconventional. So I graduated college in December of 2015. And my first stream was February 1st, 2016. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is kind of history. After that, I just kept on going. And now now here we are five and, and a half years later. <laughs> and here we are. And really took off like in the in the first six months of her streaming. I think like she she was like, I'm going to give it a go for six months and see where we're at. Mm -hmm. She did it full time and yeah, things just really took off. Yeah. What do you think attributed to that takeoff? Like, what do you think people resonated the most with? Honestly, I think it was a, uh, a few different factors. One, I treated the streaming like a full-time job. So I was lucky enough to kind of set aside six months without going to pursue a job to where I could stream nine to five, you know, 40 hours a week and basically just treat the stream as if that was the job that I had right out of college. That's a lot of hours for a streamer in the beginning. Yeah. So it that's was a lot of hours in general. That's yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. A, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. Continue. So I think it was just that, uh, that schedule that, you know, there was just more opportunities for people to discover my stream because of that. And also, I think I've got a, a personality that resonates with um, people. And, you know, I think, I don't know, I, it's kind of weird to talk about, but I, th I think it, I just did a good enough job, I guess, for people no. to be interested. I don't know. A big so. part of it's your personality. I, I also like to say, you know, there's um, opportunities when there's something missing in the market. Mm -hmm. And in this case, there wasn't a lot of females that are big on Twitch um, that are also, you know, high level competing at their game. Um, and so Ali, actually started to get really good at the game and she started beating some of the best players in the world. And I think like Blizzard wanted to promote her mm -hmm. because they were like, Hey, here's a girl who's actually doing really well at the game. And we're, we don't have a lot of those. So like, let's start putting her in events. And that was, was huge. Like they put her on the launcher for the game one day yeah. and that made a big difference. Yeah. I wow. was fortunate to have gotten the attention through social media, like the social media manager found me tweeting about Hearthstone. And so that's just a, you know, piece of advice that, you know, content creators out there, you want to be on so many different platforms, because you never know who might discover you. And so yeah, I got the attention of Blizzard. And they were kind enough to include me in different tournaments and events. And that's really where yeah. I feel like your background was super helpful. Um, you studied advertising and public relations. So I basically just applied what I learned in college to um, to a streaming <laughs> internet career, I guess. She <laughs> advertised herself. And, yeah. and I think that's really why Blizzard discovered her in the first place was she did a really good job. Like she was on a uh, airplane traveling and she pulled up Hearthstone on her phone and we got a really nice photo of her like traveling and playing Hearthstone. And I think that's the post that uh, the Blizzard manager found. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Wow. What, what, what would you attribute a lot of the success to like which platform? Cause you talked about like, it's important to be on every platform. I think yeah. it's a, it's a great rule of thumb for new creators and existing creators, which platform gave you like the biggest jump start? would you say? Well, so Twitch is my biggest platform. And as Mason was saying, there was sort of a gap in the market for like my particular game, a woman in my particular game. And so Twitch worked out really nicely for me. But I will say that one of the things that contributes to live streamers gaining more attention on Twitch is having a secondary YouTube channel as well. Like that, that I think really catapulted my live stream is, you know, making content out of the live streams and putting them up on YouTube. And then being active on, um, you know, Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. But you know, it really just depends on sure. the individual and what's going to work for them. But for me, my biggest platform is Twitch. Got you. And when when did you guys get started in crypto? I know you brought that up in the beginning because you're one of the very few creators that I know. And there's obviously a handful. There's a bunch of people dabbling in the space. But you've taken it upon yourselves to like be like one to one with crypto, right? With the launch yeah. of Ali. So when yeah. when did you like first discover crypto? Was it with Bitcoin? Like, what's the story behind that? Well, crypto was definitely my thing first. Um, but my my story was like I learned about it in 2011. Um, I was studying computer science, and one of my classmates was just like, "Have you heard about this thing?" And he was freaking out about it. Like, we were actually learning about um, RSA encryption algorithm and. He was like, oh, this uses encryption and does all this cool stuff. And I think I kind of just wrote it off in the beginning. Like I thought it was really cool. I was actually going to buy some on Mt. Gox like in 2012 <laughs> nice. or something. And I had to wire money overseas to buy it. And my bank was like, if we if we do that, we can't get the money back. And it kind of shied me off from it. So mm -hmm. I decided not to. And then in 2014, I thought I was a genius because of the Mt. Gox hack. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, good thing I avoided that scam. Um, and then I think it was like 2016, I started learning that there were like a hundred cryptocurrencies and they were doing all sorts of different things. And that just kind of piqued my interest a little bit more. And then after going through a wave of trying to learn about how all these things are going to be Bitcoin killers, it kind of brought me back to like, okay, maybe Bitcoin actually is kind of the best version of digital money. And I started to really love Bitcoin and learn more about it, get deeper into it. And that's when I, I really started to like it. And 2017 probably started putting some money into it. I started doing some mining. Um, I mined some weird stuff like burst coin using hard drive space <laughs> because I thought it was more energy efficient. And, you know, and then actually a funny story is that in 2017, I was so into this like social token idea that I launched Alicoin as an ERC20 on mm. Ethereum mainnet. And obviously nobody wanted to use it because nobody wanted to pay to send it to people and there was no way to buy it. There was no liquidity. Um, no order book or exchange. And so it kind of just fell by the wayside. I gave it to a few people and it just sits in their wallets to this day. Um, but but so that's kind of my path. I learned about it. And then once I started doing the mining and stuff, I started telling Allie more about it. And then she started to share the past, passion for it and doing her own research. I just want to bring up something interesting because yeah. you talked about Mt. Gox. And I just want to say that there's actually a decent amount of crossover between gamers and crypto enthusiasts. And it just Mt. Gox, Magic the Gathering online exchange. Okay, like Mason's been playing Magic since he was 10. I started playing Magic too. It's just like, I know that wasn't necessarily like Magic didn't have like the game didn't have too much to do with it. It's just an interesting history that, you know, it was initially a game platform. And obviously yeah. we know about the Mt. Gox You're hacks. a card game player and yeah. I'm very into crypto these yeah. days. So and just, so mm -hmm. the fact that there is that history of card games and crypto being merged together, going back as far as like 2014, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very common theme. You do see a lot of gamers uh, be those first adopters into crypto. And I think it's because like, just to relate to you guys for a minute, I, I used to play a lot of games when I was younger. I, I slowly phased out of it for whatever reason. But the first game that I, I really fell in love with, which I think a lot of people can resonate with, is RuneScape. Okay, RuneScape was that first game where like, I got hacked a bunch of times. You know, like I, I went through like ups and downs. Like they had the, the leaderboard and Zazima was always like the top one. You know, like how do you get 99 everything, you know? And there was like, there was like in-game currency. And that was the closest thing that there was to cryptocurrency, right? And I think you're also seeing this, right, with uh, with Fortnite and all these platforms have their in-game currencies that you swap for USD 
for the native token that you can then interact in the entire centralized ecosystem, right? That was one and, of my favorite things about Diablo 3. I don't know if you've heard about that, but they had this in-game auction house with items and you could buy and sell the items for real money. The gold was actually translatable to real money. They had a way you could sell like packs of a million gold for whatever the going market rate was. That to me was like the first version of a cryptocurrency that had a real economy tied to it. Like it was functional items. You could actually go farm with them and then go make additional money if you had better farming gear. Um, so yeah, I, yeah I, that's definitely a concept that crosses over a lot. Definitely. And the more I kind of go across Twitter, the more people I see with like their, their Twitter banner, like RuneScape, like old snapshots, you know, and like this guy's like an OG, <laughs> you know? So, so like the fact that, Crypto is very integrated in gaming is a very, I think, first step, right? We also saw that with crypto kitties in the launch of NFTs, mm -hmm. you know, and people breeding kitties. And you're seeing that with now, I guess, bored apes, right? More common of people basically minting these, these function, not functional, but these like images of really cool apes and they get rewarded with dogs, you know, and you start building an ecosystem and now they start developing utility. So the gaming, the graphic side was definitely obviously the first intro, but you're very unique with your story because you started, obviously, you, you got your head start with streaming, whether it be on YouTube, on Twitch, you built a really nice sizable platform across social media, Twitter, uh, Instagram, et cetera. But a lot of, I guess, a lot of what crypto minded individuals argue um, when they're pushing this narrative of Web3, okay, and I want to get your point of view on this is that the next wave of the internet must stray away from like those big corporations, the, 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 the large hands of the people that have the power over the platforms and the users, right? And that power needs to be redistributed back to the people who create the content, that consume the content, interact on the platforms through ownership and better data privacy, right? Do you resonate with that? 100%. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I also think there's um, varying degrees of it. So it kind of exists on a spectrum. And I think a lot of people get caught up in, it's either decentralized or it's centralized. And I think that for especially things like creator coins, we, we kind of want to exist somewhere in between those two. Um, because at the end of the day, it is kind of centralized. It's all based around one creator, and that's centralization to some degree. Um, but even the platform, we, we experience some of those issues of platforms being egregious with their monetization and taking right. power away from the creators. We really feel like Rally has embodied the ethos of giving the power back to the creator in a way that most of those tech companies don't. But then there's still that degree of centralization and control that they have. And their goal is like a roadmap to decentralization and giving even more power back to the creators and making it so it's like truly a, a community run by the community and not by the Rally company that they kind of had to form to get things like money transmitter licenses and mm -hmm. um, other legal frameworks to allow the things on the platform like credit card purchasing. Yeah, I, I think like an argument that people have because I actually didn't know that you went through the route of launching your own traditional ERC-20 uh, ERC token before migrating onto more of these centralized platforms. And when creators kind of go down this social token path of, okay, these platforms did a great job in building my audience, but they've, they've literally like screwed me over and trying to monetize them to an extent, right? And they now they're like, now I think people are, are kind of shifting more towards digital currencies, right? And, and personal coins, social tokens, creator coins, whatever you want to call them. And with where we are right now in the space, Mason, because you did take it upon yourself to do the ERC-20, right? Would you ever like, would you like reevaluate your thought process in the strategy of launching a traditional token? Because Ali went live on Rally in 2020, December 2020, right? From what I saw from the chart. It was, it's and, actually a little earlier than that. The chart okay. just doesn't go all the way back to the yeah. beginning. Okay. But would, would you, I guess, like, how would you advise creators whether to launch their own 720 or go to a platform like Roll, Rally, Coinvise, or all these like middlemen platforms that make minting uh, and distribution easier? I, I have to say that it's far better, in my opinion, to join another platform. Um, you just have to look out for what the, what the platform's trying to accomplish and the ways that the platform monetizes you. Because at the end of the day, I think the platforms are trying to make money or trying to add value to their core token. Um, I really like what Rally's built um, specifically out of all of them. And I think we kind of lucked out that we ended up on Rally because I don't think we did our full market research before launching it. Um, but I now that I've 
you know, we've gotten very deep in this industry and we've looked at all the competitors and we're actually really happy with Rally. Um, but it's such a different world having a platform do it for you because the piping that they create for your token and this third party developer community that's being built around Rally now, where they want to give us all these tools. We didn't have any of that when we launched our own token. So the buying and selling thing is huge on, on low market cap tokens. When somebody wants to sell a token, if you only have like 100 or 200 people in your community, they're probably going to have an order sitting on the book for like a week before it finally gets filled. And it's not going to get filled at the, at the real price that they want it at. A lot of the time they have to move it around. Um, and, and then it's also rallies built on a side chain, which, you know, it's very centralized in comparison to a lot of stuff in crypto. Right. Um, but what that allows is very cheap transactions. So people get the experience of like a, like an old web two site where they get to log in. It's a hot wallet. It's much easier for a person. And this was a big thing for Allie coming from a creator space that people didn't want to adopt crypto and learn about MetaMask and yeah. transaction hashes and how to do all of this web three stuff. They just wanted to be able to support Ali in a new way. And so this is kind of like an interim step that I see a lot of people go through in the community where they're willing to try it out because it's really easy. You can connect your Twitch to make an account and you can buy with a credit card. That's very familiar for them. And then eventually, as they learn a little bit more about what's happening behind the scenes, they finally start to branch out into getting a MetaMask and bridging some of the tokens off of the side chain and onto the main net and actually using all this crypto stuff that they shied away from because they had a familiar like gateway into the introduction of crypto. Yeah. Ali, how, how do you kind of feel about that? Like, obviously you're very, very much so on the front end. M Mason has a lot of the foundation between be, be, for the crypto, right. And all the infrastructure and the pipelines, like yeah. when you're talking to your audience and you're, you're preaching this stuff and you're trying to hype them up and get them on board to be along alongside your journey in a more intimate way, financially and personally, right? Because now they have like a, a stake in you, right? Yeah, yeah. How, how has that process been like when you're trying to communicate that to them? Yeah, I mean, I will say, you know, I'm so passionate about teaching people, not teaching, but getting people into cryptocurrency because I genuinely think it's this amazing thing for the world, right? And over the course of the years since 2017 that I started talking about it, you know, I've had to deal with people being like crypto lol, you know, like through the crash and, and everything. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes when you're like this public person, it's kind of hard to keep the enthusiasm up, you know, when it's three, $3,300 Bitcoin, right? So, you know, with Alicoin and Rally, it's been this really nice introduction for people to get into crypto in not that uh, like an aggressive of a way to be like, buy Bitcoin, you know, it's like, this is a way to support me. And it's a way to like, for people to dip their toes getting into crypto, um, into the crypto space. And so it's been, it's been really, really nice. And I'm just really looking forward to the future of social tokens and creator economies. I really believe that this is going to be the next evolution in sort of the influencer space because you know in the world of you know content creators in the internet like more and more people are making this a job right whether you're a podcaster or a youtuber um you know i think that eventually a lot of jobs are going to get automated and then humans are sort of going to be creative right and so right. when humans take this creative roles and jobs then you know, attaching cryptocurrency to it and sort of building an economy around yourself um, is, I really think is the future. So yeah, I, I've been absolutely loving it. I think it's great. So, so, so that was the, that was the intention of, of launching Alley because that was like my next question. Obviously we talked about it. We were talking about why social tokens, but the intention of Alley was to put it from a point of view where you're really starting your own creator economy and trying mm -hmm. to close those barriers internally, right? And funnel users from YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, and do it in a way where you can better monetize them. Is that why you created it? Yeah, I mean, initially uh, we had worked with the Rally developers on previous projects. So they had made different kinds of things for streamers, okay, like different applications. And so when they approached us, you know, they were like, here's cryptocurrency and 
and your forte of content creation. And, you know, there's a mix between the two of them. So for us, it just made perfect sense to try this new thing out. You know, I'll be honest, I was a little bit apprehensive in the beginning because, you know, I, it's kind of nerve wracking a little bit to say, sure. hey, I'm making myself a cryptocurrency, right? And also the notion of, you know, what if your coin goes up in value, it's attached to you. And for whatever reasons out of your control, people lose interest or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then people are really mad at you and they hold you mm -hmm. responsible for, for losing them money. So there's definitely been like some things that have been on my mind, but I think the point of creator economies is not necessarily just, just to, oh, I think Ali is going to grow. I'm going to invest in Ali. It's not just about that concept of a monetary gain. It's about participating in an economy that I'm creating, right? So I'm going to offer different services or products or experiences that are built around me. And if you want to participate and be like more closely a part of my community, then this is a, an excellent way to be involved. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's beautifully put. I think, I think that's a lot of the reason why people approach this stuff is, is for that reason specifically. So let's talk about what can you do with Ali right now? Like what's the utility the value beyond just the price itself. Yeah. So one of the most successful things so far with Alicoin, uh, what is my Alicoin tournament? So, you know, again, I am a Hearthstone streamer and my community had been asking me to run Hearthstone tournaments for like years at this point. And I just never really like, knew how to run a tournament that well. And then Mason was like, okay, well, this is the perfect opportunity to get them into the concept of alley coin by taking something familiar like which is the game and participating in tournaments and having alley coin roped into that so basically what we did is we set a threshold like if you're an alley coin holder you're basically guaranteed to participate in this 16 player 32 player um event and then we had the prize payout in alley coin as well mm. and you know i was very you know, I said all the time, like, hey, you can hold on to your alley coin for future uh, use cases, or you can sell it for cash if you want. You know, I was always like very transparent about that. So people, you know, might not be too nervous to get into it. So we held eight qualifier tournaments um, and then had a grand finals. Um, and that was an excellent way for natural interest from my community um, to happen with alley coin because, you know, over the course of four months, Alley coin tournaments, quote, quote, you know, would come up and different viewers would be like, oh, well, what's Alley coin? So it was that was probably one of the most successful things um, to get people into it. And then recently, actually, Mason, you want to talk about the merch? Because he came up with the whole system of how we were going to release a merchandise. So he can take yeah, that. but before we go, before we even get to that, because I want to hear about the merch, how many people that were holding Alley coin actually participated in the tournament? So we did not bar people off. Like people could play if they okay. didn't hold Alley because we didn't, you know, we want people to be involved and not say, oh, you absolutely have to be an Alley coin holder. Right. Um, so I would say, I don't less than 50% in the beginning. Was, I think it was around 50%. Or maybe around 50, so the way yeah. we did it was, you know, there's 16 slots for the tournament. We okay. would give a certain number of slots to coin holders and a certain number of slots to a raffle. So mm -hmm. more people would want to play in the tournament than we could fit in. And so we would prioritize the coin holders and then we would give it to the rest of the people. So, but it, in general, it ended up being around 50%. Some tournaments were like 70% coin holders and then other ones were maybe like 40%, but always a good chunk of coin holders for sure. What wound up happening though, is that as the tournaments went on, more and more people became coin holders because they hmm. kind of believed in the system. So maybe it was less than 50% in the first two, but by tournament eight, I would say that over... Kind of like 70 there were some people who like tried to get into a tournament two or three times and didn't get in and then they went and they bought a coin because they were like i'm playing in the next one <laughs> right and and that was kind of fun to see that people could see the value of holding one of these coins outside of just monetary value and that's a big thing i think for creator coins is non-monetary value if you're not giving people an experience or a, an actual physical item or something else i think there's only so much of up on the roller coaster that you can have before eventually you come down. And if it's all about speculating on the value of the coin, when it comes down, it's going to crash really hard and it's probably yeah. not going to come back. Mm -hmm. 
So out of like the rewards that you guys distributed, how many of them actually held Ali versus sold? That's, that's a tough one. We'd have to probably dig through some analytics to find out, but I'd say, I'd say most of the smaller winners held on yeah. to the coin because actually cashing out is not the easiest thing. You have to bridge the token out, which is an Ethereum transaction. And then you have to swap rally for Ethereum on Uniswap, which right. is like, was, I mean, it was $40 at least for a while there. I don't know what it is now. Um, but so if somebody won $50 in the tournament, they're paying $8 to bridge it out and then $40 to swap it. They don't have any money left at that point. <laughs> um, but, but the people who won like 500 bucks or more, or they won 150 and it turned into a thousand because the coin actually did really well. <laughs> um, some of those people did cash out. We had one person cash out for like 10 grand and they got laser eye surgery and a new gaming chair, wow. and a new yeah. PC, like, and they were just like so happy about Alley coin. <laughs> I just want to speak on that really quickly, just from the creator perspective, you know, over the course of five and a half years, you know, I, my career has been sustained by the support of my community, right? So whether it's people subscribing to my Twitch channel or donate, just donating to me because they appreciate my content. Um, and now Alicoin has been a way to give back, you know, in, it's more of a two way relationship um, where I can give back to the people that have supported me for so long. So as Mason said, yeah, someone got LASIK eye surgery with the money that they made off of Ali. Um, wow. You know, like computer, you know, cra crazy stuff. And um, that just personally oh, I was so quite fulfilled. I was looking through the Discord because uh, you have you have the Alley Coin channel, you have the the crypto channel, and I was scrolling up to the top to see like what kind of conversations people are having. And someone literally wrote, "I bought a computer, I bought this," and yeah. the, and then I think uh, Mason, you responded like, "Nice, like good win." Yeah. <laughs> so I, so people, go ahead. Oh, I, was just gonna I, say, I love that channel. That we have a bot with Alley channel yeah. in the Discord, and it's just for people to post what they bought with Alley because people wanted to talk about it, so we we wanted a place for people to discuss. One thing that I do say though is just. You know, these creator uh, coins are not necessarily supposed to just be this like speculative thing, right? You shouldn't really just be buying Ali because you think Ali's going to go up in value. It's just kind of a nice thing that if you buy Ali to participate in my economy, there's a chance it can go up in value, and which it did for a lot of people. And then they were able to, you know, get some monetary benefit. So. Yeah. And uh, what about the merch? You started telling me about this merch that oh, you yeah. guys started yeah. developing. Um, just before the merch for a second, because this leads into the merch, I want sure. to talk about um, Rally does this really cool thing called the Rally Rewards Program. So it works a lot like a DeFi project that will give you tokens for, you know, adding liquidity. Um, the, the creators that are adding value to the platform, which they mainly measure by if your coin is growing or not over the last four weeks, they give you a dividend in the form of new Rally tokens. Um, and so most of these creators, like that's a great way to monetize without having to sell your coin and kind of like rug pull your audience a bit, um, is to get these rally rewards as a dividend and then use them for something. And so our idea was, okay, well, let's take that dividend, let's sell it for some cash and let's go do some fun things for the community that's non-monetary value. And so the first thing we wanted to do is, Ali was making this new merch with a new merch company. And we thought it was really cool. We wanted to get it in the hands of as many people as possible. So we came up with a program to take those rewards, pre-purchase like a wholesale amount of shirts and hoodies, and just give people 100% off discount codes if they held on to some Alley coin. Mm. So we came up with a tiered system, like the guys who held 100 Alley coin would get a lot of items, and then people who held one Alley coin, I get 10 Alley coin, you got one item. Uh, one Alley coin, you got a $5 item. So you can, and you could buy that with Alley coin and these shirts are $30 to $50. So it was a, it was a heavy discount. Um, and we sold up or we gave away a bunch of shirts that way. And people were just so thrilled. They're like, not only has my Alley coin gone up in value and I'm getting some dividends, but now I'm getting free merch on top of that, which is merch. I really like, cause I like Alley as a creator and no matter what people tell them in real life, like your coin's going to crash or you're going to lose all that money you put in. At least they can say, I got an experience. I played in a tournament and I got this awesome shirt. And I think that leaving them with that, regardless of what happens with the token price, is something awesome that we can do for the community. You know, it's interesting because I, I talk to a lot of creators, a lot of people that have, have taken themselves public, quote unquote, right, as people like to say and think about. And Rally's tokenomics, the way they designed the system is really remarkable. It's very interesting how they did it. And they've seen growth because they've earned that, right? Like they've really introduced something novel to the world. Um, one thing that I hear from creators is 
a concern that they get is because Rally is somewhat centralized, okay, and a lot of your token success depends on the performance of Rally, that because they're already tinkering in a world of crypto that's already risky, and then tagging that along into a platform where your success as a creator and the value of your currency depends proportionally to a different currency that underlies that value, they get, they get not fearful, but it's a barrier to entry, right? In, in addition to ERC-20 tokens are already hard to launch and provide liquidity to, right? And Roll like, is somewhat also centralized with the smart contracts and their minting contracts and whatnot. Was that was that a fear? Of, did you guys have that concern at all, or was it like they just they started talking to me? I trusted them and their team and their vision, and we just went forward. Like, what what was your head at during that process? Well, I can answer that in a in a few ways, actually. Okay. I mean, and it, it could be a lengthy answer, but I'll try and keep it short. Um, we we did have a good relationship with the team, like we said, so we did trust them to that degree. Um, but like I also like we said, we tried doing this on our own, and it just it didn't work for us. And maybe it works for somebody who's a really large creator or they have a team of developers right. that can make some of those tools for them. But the, the not having liquidity is just a huge issue. And also having it on Ethereum mainnet, like maybe if we could launch it on Matic now, it would be different because it would be so cheap for people to use it. But I mean, it's just, it was a huge pain on Ethereum. We don't mind tying it to a platform that we like what they're providing to us, right? Like you could make a website and upload photos, but it's not like you have an Instagram at that point. And I think at some point you have to make the leap and say, Instagram is providing me a platform. It's worth giving them some of my monetization to, to have that be the place where all of my fans go to look at my photos. And for us, we need a place that all of our fans go to buy the cryptocurrency and use the cryptocurrency because that place is more functional than it is by itself, like on its own website. Um, but then also with tying it to the platform, you know, that was an interesting um, change that they actually made in the beginning. It was going to be USDC that backed all the coins, from my understanding. And, and that's how it started. And then they changed the bonding curve to be with the rally token, which at first I was a little skeptical about because I was like, oh, no, we're tied to the, the success of the platform now. But as we work with the team more and we we trust them and we learn to believe in what they're creating and all of the developer community as well, which is outside of them. And their ethos really is to, to make this a decentralized project one day where there is no internal rally team. And mm -hmm. it's really just managed by the community and through voting, but it's a transition to get there. It might take four or eight years, who knows? Um, yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to say is um, with the coin value, there's, it does move on its own curve. So we've seen a lot of alley growth against the rally token. Sure. Um, even as the rally token has been coming down in this market crash, alley token has been growing against rally, which has helped kind of level out the price a lot. Um, it could have fallen, you know, from, from $60 to maybe $15, but instead it only came down to about like 27. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because it's been growing on its own against the system. And I think that's really cool. But then the other thing that they're working on is allowing us to bridge the token off of the platform. And at yeah. that point it would no longer be fully tied to rally. Like if, if rally completely fails, Maybe people still want to buy the Alley coin outside of the Rally platform, right. not using the Rally bonding curve anymore, but in a different marketplace. Maybe we launch it on like ApeSwap on Polygon or something. Yeah. Know? Yeah. No, very, very solid points. And I think it's a it's a common thing in crypto uh, with new projects that are coming out. They have their foundations, their nonprofits that a certain a, a portion of tokens is allocated to that foundation to hire employees, marketing engineers, operations, whatever. And then once they they feel more established and they have a good system and a good control of what's happening, they slowly start releasing the keys to the community. And the best example of that is MakerDAO, right? That's very much a, a, a DeFi platform, not so much social tokens, but I think there's overlap. But referencing them because they started off not centralized, they started as fully decentralized, their protocol at least, but they had the foundation uh, piggybacking it and, and driving a lot of its success by having contributors, developers, marketing people, ops people that manage the day-to-day and -day in the, in the, the, I guess, the image and the look and feel of, of Maker, right? So 100% a, a strategy, and especially when you're entering such a, a weird space that's very gray and very experimental, there needs to be some familiarity for sure, right? With how things are done, how things are structured. So I, I, I hear you. I want to kind of pivot more into the streaming side of things because 
there's this cool uh, function, obviously, on Twitch that a lot of people know about bits, right? And people mm -hmm. kind of rewarding people in bits and cheering them on. And in many ways, it's very relatable to a social token uh, because I've seen creators leverage their own currency to receive tips as well, right? How do you kind of differentiate like receiving tips in Ali versus receiving tips in bits? Like, is that even a thing that you're thinking about? What's your thought process there? Honestly, I haven't really thought too much about kind of comparing the two for my audience. Like, I understand that there is still a lot of apprehension to crypto from a lot of people. So, you know, I've, I accept the Twitch system of bits, you know, and I try to talk about Alicoin naturally as much as possible, just for the sake of teaching people about what I offer with Alicoin and stuff like that. But right now they're two very separate forms of support, you know, and I, and I, and I never say, Oh, like you just gave some bits. You could give me Ali instead, you know, like I, I don't really do that kind, <laughs> of thing, kind of thing, you know? Um, and yeah, so maybe in the future, when creator economies and creator uh, coins are more commonplace, you know, people will opt for, you know, that form of support. But right now, as it currently stands, bits like Twitch has just made it so easy to support creators through their bit system. Um, and so, you know, you know, people used to actually just send individual donations through PayPal and stuff like that. Right. And since bits have been introduced on Twitch, like I hardly get like, uh, external donations because most people just use the bit system. Um, I forget how much of a cut. Um, it's 40 to 24%, I believe, okay. with 24% being if you buy the largest bulk pack of bits. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. But yeah, which is which is really high, by the yeah. way. Like <laughs> PayPal was, when, when we were doing it through Streamlabs with PayPal, I think it was like 3%. Mm -hmm. um, and That's crazy. With Alicoin, it's, I guess it depends on how you look at it, but it's basically fee free. Um, yeah. There's there's no real fee to do it. Now, of course, when you do that, you're buying rally token first to place it behind in the pool yeah. for the bonding curve with the, the alley coin. So there's maybe like a small hidden tax there in the terms of like rallies getting a cut somehow in the tokenomics there. But it's still I feel like it it's more direct. Do you feel that way, too? Oh yeah, absolutely. You, YouTube takes a pretty decent chunk um, in their donation system as well. So yeah, I think maybe in time when this becomes more popular, people will opt for this form of support because it's not just, you know, as I said earlier, it's not just uh, donating to the creator. The donator gets something or should be getting something out of the experience as well. So it, it's more uh, it's beneficial for all parties. I love it when you buy Ali because it makes my coin go up in value, but you should like it more too because you're not just donating and then never seeing that money ever again. Maybe you get to get a free shirt out of it or participate in something that I put on or, you know, et cetera. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the more equivalent thing. So if, if, if Twitch takes anywhere between, you said 20 to 40%, 25 to 40%, right? The more equivalent thing is now wanting to swap Ali for rally and then rally for ETH and then ETH or rally for USDC and then putting that USDC in Coinbase, withdrawing from Coinbase to your bank account and going through all those layers and everyone taking a cut from the network to the platforms and et cetera, et cetera. So shit's messy right now. Yeah, <laughs> I will say that's another yeah. awesome thing about rally is they're thinking about that and they want to actually become like a, a PayPal or a Coinbase and allow people to connect a bank account to their rally account mm -hmm. and withdraw directly from there. And then a lot of those fees will go away. Yeah. 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 Make, makes sense. Can you tell me a little bit more about your community? Like who, who are your friend, your fans? Uh, what's that general audience? Are they mainly male, female? Are they more crypto native than not crypto? Tell me a little bit more about them. Sure. Uh, so I play a card, card games, and I would say that card games generally have a little bit older of an audience as opposed to a game like Fortnite, for example, right? So my main demographics are is um, male 24 to 35. That's the majority of my uh, community. And, you know, I, I definitely have some women um, here and there, but in general, there are definitely more males in the gaming space. Um, and that's changing with time. And it also, I think it depends on what game it, I find that more males are into card games as opposed to something like, 
I don't know, Valorant or Among Us and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I would say that because I've got a little bit of an older audience, you know, introducing Alicoin and cryptocurrency has, is really nice because, you know, if you, if I was a Fortnite streamer, you know, and a lot of my uh, audience was, you know, 15 year old boys, um, you know, getting them into cryptocurrency might be a little bit harder <laughs> of an experience. Um, so it's all just really worked out in that, you know, Mason's initial passion for blockchain and crypto, introducing it to me, teaching me about it, and then having um, the landscape to be able to introduce it to my community. Um, it's, it's really, you know, I think it was just meant to be, honestly. And then there's a there's a second community, like a sub community sort of okay. thing at this point where like uh, the yes. more that Alicoin gets brought up and, and there's naturally always somebody who hasn't heard about it. So they ask questions and then like the sub community pops out and they all jump in to answer all these questions and introduce it. And, you know, they link the discord and then people join the discord and they start talking right. in there. Now we have a community of like 570 people or something 584. like that. 584. Okay. Yeah. It just keeps growing. I can't keep track. Of I looked at the number like right before this. Okay. So that's okay. Nice. Um, but it's awesome that it just it just keeps growing. And so now we have this subset of people that are really into cryptocurrency and they have all these questions about crypto. And it's awesome to like see people go through that progression of mm -hmm. just learning about crypto. And now they're learning about it through social tokens first. And then they go in and they're like, okay, but why would I want to decentralize money? And they, it gets them thinking in a new way that, mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be people who naturally gravitate toward crypto the second they hear about it. But there's also a larger portion of people, I think, that are kind of resistant to the concept and finding that, that in with them to show them, hey, here's something fun you can do with crypto that's actually relevant to your life. It mm -hmm. gets them hooked. And, and then... I love helping them go further down the path. They're like, can you recommend a good YouTuber? Um, I'm trying to learn about liquidity pools. Can you help me with that? And and that's like, I love that because yeah. for me, it's all about everything in crypto, not just having decentralized money, but decentralized finance and decentralized um, creator economies and all that stuff. So You know what that reminds me of really quick is mm -hmm. when Elon, Elon Musk, I remember when there was a period where there was a bottleneck with pushing out uh, cars and onboarding new customers. So they, the cars already received and reached the, the retail location. Uh, but there were so many demands, like so many orders in demand and so many people needed to get their cars that he tweeted uh, to his community, to the Tesla community, if anybody wants to come down and, and help like basically onboard other Tesla uh, buyers and, and fans meet us at this time at this place and work with the employees who are getting paid and come volunteer with them to onboard people. And the only reason I bring that up is, you know, a lot of creators tend to think like, man, how am I going to educate my my audience? How am I going to mm -hmm. and uh, tell them about MetaMask, Bitcoin, all this, all these like different layers and loopholes. And when you think about it, when you build such like a cult following to an extent or such a strong fan base, the community starts educating one another, yeah. right? And that and that that power starts to kind of uplift off of your shoulders and into the people who've really seen the success and the value that you're creating for them, right? And they and, and they kind of take it upon themselves from what it sounds like, like, wow, I got to show them. Welcome. Let me show you the power behind this, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like one of my favorite things now is, you know, when I'm streaming and I'm playing my game, like I'm pretty distracted, right? Like I, I'm doing all these different things, multitasking and, you know, someone, Alicoin will come up and someone will ask, what is Alicoin? You know, it's kind of hard to give the full spiel while also trying to win a strategy game, right? <laughs> right. So I've built enough of a community now that, you know, people are sort of excited to answer the question for me, you know, direct them to the discord, uh, which is really nice. And I just wanted to touch on uh, something that, you know, the discord Mason is always in there, like answering people's questions, like taking the time to private, like if someone needs a personal uh, problem solved, like he's, you know, taking it upon himself to help them in a private message and, and do that kind of stuff. But, you know, we've just, I'm, or I'm surprised at how much, you know, Alicoin has become sort of a new subset of my content creation. Like, you know, I gaming, streaming, that was my thing. And now a decent amount of time is become Alicoin. And, you know, I don't can't remember what prompted it. But another thing that we were doing um, is like on Wednesdays, we do our own, we call it a podcast. It's not really a podcast. It's a live stream where we talk about crypto. And so it's an, ex, it's a time 
for the Alley Coin community to ask us questions just like on what we think. And some of the questions that are asked during that live stream are like very, very basic crypto questions. And so that just gives you an indication of like this really is a lot of people's first time inquiring and trying to learn more. And so I was yeah. surprised though on some of those live streams that mm -hmm. people would ask like really good questions. And well, I was yeah, like, I was like, that's good. actually really insightful. And yeah. you know, they might just be somebody who's more experienced than the general crowd, but I oh, still yeah. try to answer it because like anyone can take away something from it. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from even people who we hadn't seen in the stream a lot for a mm -hmm. while, they would pop back up in the live stream and they would say, Hey, thanks so much for doing that. Like I've been meaning to learn more about cryptocurrency and the fact that it was you and we we're familiar with you and especially Ali, you know, you asked like what makes her popular. It's her ability to play the game and explain it well at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Thanks. she's good at educating people. So when there's this topic that's a little intimidating for them, which, you know, used to be Hearthstone, but now might be cryptocurrency, they naturally gravitate to Ali to learn from her. And Mason too here. I mean, like it, that's the, it's really been this amazing thing that we can do together where, you know, Mason's got the so much expertise on like knowing the technicals and stuff like that. And so the two of us just sort of being this, I don't know, duo and, and helping people learn more about it and, and create these different things for the alley coin community. It's been, um, it's been really amazing. What's up guys. Really quick. Just want to shout out our amazing sponsors who are helping make season one a reality. Season 1 welcomes Coinvise, where you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Go check them out at coinvise.co. Season 1 welcomes POAP, P-O-A-P, short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, which enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT tech, POAP facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities, and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. They are hiring for roles like biz dev, key account management and operations. You can apply by visiting adamlevy.io forward slash POAP. That's P-O-A-P. All right, back to the episode. So it sounds like the community is strong. They're loving Alleycoin. Uh, they're 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 encouraging others and onboarding others to use it. And from a, a point of view, with what's kind of trending in the creator economy in the crypto world as it pertains to uh, creators, whatever. Okay, there's this concept of DAOs being rolled out that's very popular amongst traditional DeFi and, and crypto projects that. Now there's narratives of now creators are going to have their own DAOs. And from what it sounds like, your audience is at a point where you could start forming those DAOs. And I, and I don't know if you guys already have that in place where, and let me start with this. Are you guys familiar with DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organizations? Basically, what it means is your token holders are now like members of the community to the extent where they can now vote on proposals and govern the alley community beyond Ali beyond Mason, right? right? So now they have a like, so now when they hold a token, they have a share of a voice in how the platform, how the brand kind of proceeds forward with its growth, right? That's definitely the long term vision. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that functionality just hasn't been built yet. So we haven't been able to implement as much of it as we'd like. But when we talk to other creators, that's always something I'm pitching. I'm like, give your community some voice for holding this coin. And if I talk to someone who's, you know, like an artist that they're a singer. I'm like, if whatever you're comfortable giving up, you know, maybe it's like the topic of your next song, or maybe it's the key that you sing it in, yeah. you know, give some power back to your community so that they can have input on what they would like from you. And you might even like that input and, and it can help you as an artist. Um, and so for us, we're always trying to think of things that we can allow the community to vote on um, in order to feel like they're participating more in this economy that they're now you know, like you said, kind of shareholders in. Right. There's got to be a good balance, though, you know, where you're allowing the community to vote on certain things, but you still are, you know, making dis decisions for something that you want for your economy. Like, I, I think there's probably got to be a good, um, a good balance. Between so, for example, right, the first thing that comes to mind, <clears throat> excuse me, is you already have these tournaments, right, that you're doing. You could put proposals in place and how that tournament gets executed and organized, sure. right? It's less, it's less, it's less about like 
what's Ali going to eat for breakfast today? You know, like, let, let, let's oh, say, be fun. That can be fun. <laughs> like she's either going to do whole milk or almond milk, you know, guys vote. Like that's not where my head's at. I'm saying like having the community partake in the activities and having like proposals put in place that they can vote and execute and even like take it upon themselves to build. Right. Because if they have a certain amount of Ali, and you and you tell me, is this even a vision that you would you would see a, a reality for a community? Is there will be a time where the rally or the the alley community gets bigger and bigger? You have a certain amount of individuals that hold a lot more alley than others, mm-hmm. right? And they believe in you so much, they love everything that you're doing. They can even start working for you to an extent, right? And and live it's off these like. Started. Okay, yeah. so tell me about that. What does that look like now? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few different working relationships we have. And like you said, when, when someone gets a lot of the coin, they kind of want to do stuff for free just because they're like, Hey, if I can increase the value of the coin, then that means my holdings are going to go up. And so we have one mod that he did a bunch of work for us on a tournament. And I, I gave him like a hundred bucks of the coin and he's like, you know, you don't have to pay me. Right. And I was like, I mean, I want to pay you because you're, you're doing work to help the, um, the whole ecosystem, but he wanted to do it anyway, because he just wanted the ecosystem to do better. And then there's another guy we brought in specifically just to kind of spruce up the discord. And since I've gotten busy working on a bunch of things, I wanted somebody in there always answering questions Mm -hmm. because I don't want people feeling like they're lost at all in this community. So he's been amazing and we pay him monthly. Um, But he also has just taken it upon himself to do all this extra stuff. Like he came up with this concept of a text-based video game that you could play in the discord, typing to a discord bot. And you know, like those really old school Mm text-based RPGs. And if you get to the end of the game, then you win some alley coin. And so it's like a cool. great way to create engagement with the fan base. And it's an idea that he came up with all on his own. And now he's doing all the legwork to like develop the text base, um, so the cool. prompts that people That's are so doing. cool. You know what that reminds me of? Like if you compare it to what's happening in the less sexier DeFi crypto world, you know, all these big projects that are decentralized, they have a certain amount of tokens allocated towards a grant that goes to fund projects, software, solutions, tools that get built to help push the community, improve the community. And for what it sounds like, um, when we launched, we were one of the first 10 creators on the platform and they decided to give us or to buy a bunch of our coin and give it to us as a treasury. Yeah. And in the beginning, we were doling it out really slowly. We actually gave some coins out for free just to people who would sign a Google document and like almost (laughs) nobody signed it, but those people I think that's like worth four grand now or yeah. something. So we gave wow. out four grand for free. And just if you would just sign the Google sign up form, um, now people wish they could go back and do it. But Dude, this I is so powerful. People that don't know that they have it too. Like they yeah. have yeah. been there from the beginning. I can see a few names in my my holders where it's the exact amount that we gave out in the beginning. I'm like, hey, you got four thousand dollars worth of Alex. There, but. but with how successful the con- coin's been, it's like the U.S. dollar value of the treasury has just been continuing to grow. And no matter yeah. how much we spend from it, like for these tournaments or for hiring people to help out, it's growing faster than we are actually using it. So at this point, we think it could last us years, um, which Crazy. is really awesome because it gives us just a ton of room to hire people and develop the ideas that we want. And that's something that no other platform has really given to us, right? When that platform's like so successful, they're not like, oh, let's, our early creators give them a bunch of shares in the company that they can sell and use to fund their own growth. But that's something we get with Rally because we are tied to the platform and the coin grows along with the platform. And that's that's the positive side of being tied to it is that like the rising tide floats all boats and the creators that got in early have done really well on the platform yeah. just from the fact that the platform's grown. But, right. you know, I kind of want to say though, that we, even though we were one of the first 10 people on the platform, you know, it's still really, really early. You know what I mean? Like mo- the notion of creator economies and creator coins, like I believe will kind of have their boom in, in at some point here, someone huge, like a, a big name, Kim Kardashian or whoever, you know, is probably going to, at some point, I think launch their own creator coin, and that will set off this sort of ripple effect um, to really shed light on the space. So I still think it's really early for uh, creators, businesses, whomever to create their own uh, tokens. Yeah, I agree with you. The other day, uh, Kim Kardashian that 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 just because you're bringing her up started shilling Ethereum Max, like a fork of really? Ethereum that. Yeah, just like a shit coin, right? Just like another another shit coin. When I'm thinking like, 
why not why not just create your own currency and and just do kim or booty or whatever like your brand is <laughs> right you know like whatever yeah, whatever great. you want your brand is whatever your audience associates you with like why shill and i don't think she's even educated to that extent she, and it's not her fault right she's not aware of how deep this is she, she's focused on her beauty brand whatever but a hundred percent and i think the creators who get early into the social token economy will start seeing growth and rewards that are going to outpace traditional influencers and creators. And the best example that we have from that is TikTok and all the Instagram influencers that struck rich and big and have their hundreds of millions of followers to hundreds of thousands of followers are now kind of getting outdated because attention is now on TikTok. And you have all these Gen Z, millennials, even even like boomers gaining a lot of like a huge following when they otherwise wouldn't have been able to on Instagram. So attention, shift in energy, shift in power, be an early adopter. That's the takeaway here, right? Be an early adopter. Yeah. So yeah. I'm optimistic. You know, ho hopefully, I don't know, hopefully it, it goes well. Yeah. So I, I, I go ahead. You're going to oh, say no, something? I'm yeah. yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe it was feedback. Okay. I got another question. Okay. So in, in terms of your Discord now, because people use Discord as a very like centralized hub to funnel in. Uh, people from all these different platforms to create a central line of communication for their for their audiences right now we have the ability to create these token gated features where if you have a certain amount of valley coins you get access to certain perks and features and my my, my whole thought process is, is one what is your funnel for getting more people into discord because on one end it's such a valuable tool and you want as much of your community in there. So what's your funnel with getting people in there? Mm -hmm. And once they're in there too, how do you convert them into alley holders so that they can partake more into the whole entire experience of alley? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, again, my biggest platform is my live stream, right? right? So every time that I bring up the alley coin discord on my stream, like I try not to overdo it, right? You know, I want it to be natural, but we can see, a significant amount or an increase in people come in after I mention it, particularly after our crypto chats as well, because obviously there's more crossover there. But, um, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll tweet about it and stuff like that. But I would say the, the biggest funnel is me just using my biggest platform and saying, hey, you know, Alicoin is this. And if you want to know more like the nitty gritty, more details, then please, you know, join the discord. And then that's where you can find more and interact with people, um, ask questions and that kind of thing. That's a, a great funnel is the tournament circuit. Oh, so yes, for sure. mm -hmm. part of the prerequisite to sign up for the circuit is to be a member of the discord and to put your discord name in. And that's how we grab cool. new members. And we run the tournaments mainly through discord besides the, like the bracketing system, which mm -hmm. is on a separate site. Everything else, the communication, the getting people into the tournament and choosing the participants and communicating with them, it's all done through the Discord. So that's a great funnel to get them in there, get them to be an active member, and to get them to attach their rally account to the Discord, which is another big step that people make. Yeah. Once they've done that, I, I tend to see the people who have done that, they stick around and they become long-term members of the community because now they see the value like in you can send coins to another person just through a Discord bot command, which is awesome. You don't even have to log into the website and use that. So people are starting to like really form a community in there of coin holders. And you'll see things like someone wants more Alley coin um, and another person wants Hearthstone packs. So they'll buy them packs and they'll send them Alley coin in return. Um, and so it's a, it's its own like e-commerce thing that's going on between the members of the community. And that's all enabled by the Discord. So that's really how we get it, get people okay. to stick around as they see that activity and they're like, oh, I can be a part of this now and, and participate in the tournaments and the different stuff I can do with the coin. And it's all run through the discord. Yeah. Discord is just so, so instrumental in building a tight knit community. Like, you know, I, we often get the question asked, you know, like my amount of supporters um, in terms of like total holders is actually less than some other people, but the price of my coin is higher. And I really feel like the reason for that is that, you know, I've just got a pretty tight knit loyal community. And a lot of that has come about by, you know, uh, individual interaction and engagement that comes about from a platform like Discord. So, um, you know, I would definitely recommend, you know, any creators 
that kind of thing. Build an external community to your main platform and um, and definitely utilize it a lot. The, the takeaway is, about, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. uh, um, you also asked earlier about what like um, the typical audience member of Ali is. And, and right. the one thing I also want to say about these people besides their age and demographic is that they're because they play a mobile game, they're very used to dropping a lot of money on it. Like Hearthstone's an expensive game to play. So a lot of these people will spend 400 to a thousand dollars a year on Jesus. Hearthstone packs, which is a lot of mobile games will milk that kind of money out of you because they find little microtransactions to get you to pay more. And so I think they're, they're already comfortable spending money on digital products, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to Hearthstone, like the tournament circuit. So when they learn about Alleycoin and they put a little bit of money in, and then they see it go up in value or they see that they're getting a use out of it or they get a free shirt. They're like, okay, maybe this is something I want to put more money into. And they're kind of comfortable doing that because they already do it on all these other mobile games. Um, so I think that's been a big benefit to the coin value. Right. That's It's powerful. And then another, another metric I want to bring up is, so right now you have 538 members, 34 members in the Discord, 71 of which actually hold the token in Discord. Yet on Rally, you have over 700 contributors holding Ali. Right. Yeah. How I do you the rally number just to clarify is people yeah. who have bought it, but if they've sold it, they still get counted in, in that number. Okay. Whereas gotcha. in the discord, it would tick down when somebody sells the coin. Mm -hmm. Got you. Got you. So I guess like in the future, right. When you have more people holding, assuming two, three years from now, Ali is one of the top social communities out there for your niche of streaming, gaming, maybe even bridges on beyond that. Um, and people become more native to social tokens because they realize that the financial upside of trading people, that's obviously a thing that's coming from here in communities, which is very scary to think about, but it's the reality of it. How do you, I guess, have you guys started thinking about, or how would you kind of approach, there's a lot of people holding and investing, but not engaging and participating, right? So how do you kind of, how do you kind of clear the fog from the investors and funnel them in more to become participants rather than just relying on the financial upside or downside of buying and selling your token? That's a really good question. Honestly, I feel like, I feel like you should take that up with Bitcoin, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because like... Bitcoin, you have the traders, right? And then you also have the people, the core contributors who help push out updates, et cetera. Right. But yeah, how do yeah. you kind of think and we about have that? Both too. I just, you know, there's always going to be speculators. I don't think you yeah. can get rid of them entirely. Um, we, we, but it's, a, it's still a good question. Um, do you want to try Honestly, and answer that? Yeah. I'm not sure to be completely honest. Like I, I think the best thing that I can do in that situation is just come up with things that people find valuable, you know, like maybe some of the contributors or the people that hold Ali, you know, don't really care that much about the merch right now, or maybe they don't play Hearthstone. So they don't have any reason to participate in the tournament, you know, but maybe at some point in time, I will come up with various use cases that will eventually get more and more people, um, you know, uh, involved. And, you know, I would imagine that a lot of the holders are just, you know, people in the rally ecosystem, and they're excited about the concept of creator coins. And so maybe they're not jumping at every opportunity to engage super closely, but they're just like kind of a supporter of uh, the system. And, you know, maybe they like what we're doing, even though they're not necessarily participating themselves. But yeah, like, I'm not sure exactly the best way to get more engagement going quite I think yet, the merch but... thing was great because it pulled some people out of the woodwork like we're like mm -hmm. hey we're giving away a free shirt That's all you have true. to do is connect your discord mm -hmm. and then say what you want because connecting the discord is the way that we can verify how many coins they own and and then we just say claim your free merch and if somebody's not interested in free merch then i mean we're not going to get them that way but yeah. i think a lot of people even if they're just like speculator, they're going to see these perks that we come up with and they're going to be like, well, I guess it's worth my time to go connect my discord and get and claim that piece of free merch. And maybe we need to come up with more things that we can do to entice them to actually participate rather than just hold the coin on rally and, and get the financial upside. And I just want to bring up another thing that, that uh, this concept of like, who's really engaged versus just kind of like a passive supporter is not something really specific to this. Like, you know, I have usually a thousand people watching me stream. The amount of people that are typing in the Twitch chat 
and joining my personal Ali Straza Discord or donating bits or following me on social media is probably pretty small, actually, to the to the average passive viewer. You know even, what I mean? Even like a lot of those people don't have Twitches. They don't follow yeah. her on Twitch. They just, as an anonymous user, go to Hearthstone category, see that she's online and click it and watch. And yeah. they might be a regular viewer, but they still won't even make a Twitch. Like when you started watching Twitch, it took you a while to actually make an account. Right? I didn't make an account until you started streaming. Yeah. And you and I watch Twitch all the time. I just never wanted to make an account or like get that involved in a community. Yeah. Mm. I, I will say that, you know, purchasing my creator coin is definitely a more active though than just like passively watching content. But still, you know, I, I can see why people might just believe in what I'm doing and, and want to support the system. And, you know, maybe like, as I said, Maybe they don't play tournaments or really care that much about having Ali Strauss and merch, but, you know, but with more things that we create, you know, the merch was probably a wider um, or a more broad benefit where like, if you're competing in the Hearthstone tournament, you got to like actually be a Hearthstone player and, and have decks and, and have decks. Willing you know? to so, you know, you said people came out of the woodwork for the merchandise. So that's because there was more uh, of a broader benefit. So with, maybe with each thing that we introduce, you know, it'll strike a chord with different people. Sure. Sure. It's so fascinating. You know, the more I learn about your community and the, the health of the token and the supporters, I'm starting to realize you guys have probably by far the most, like the most healthy creator economy that you've built um, from utility, right. To the price being driven up to, um, or not price, like the growth and the performance, at least of the token to the number of discord members and holders that you guys have to now also developing a grants program, like an unofficial grants program where you're paying people to create tools, mm -hmm. Discord tools, whatever tools to help kind of push and engage the community even forward, even more so, which is like the cherry on top is now hiring people in the community to help manage the community. And yeah. like all these, all these points are critical to sustaining like a, a very efficient creator economy. And I think you guys built yourself and maybe you don't even realize how, how, how like hard that is to do, you know, when you're, when you're bringing people into crypto and you're, you're telling them internet funny money, you know, and, and numbers yeah. going up and down and, <laughs> and there's this, this shit coin from ass, from, from <laughs> those, from sheep, like all these, like nobody, it's so much fog and there's hard to build clarity and you guys are building somewhat or in the, in the genesis of building a self-sustaining ecosystem for yourself right and obviously you can attribute the growth of the token because from the time of of, of this recording i'd see it's about 24 dollars 63 63 cents okay and when it got started it was at 26 cents now not to shill token price here lower than that lower than price okay so i only see what what rally provides yeah in terms they of only the go back to december yeah Great. so that growth for people who were part of the community, believed in you, engaged in these tournaments, engaged in these activities, were core contributors to helping build the brand, saw the upside. And I think that's a lot of the ethos from what people are trying to kind of encapsulate here is there's, there's power behind being an early adopter. There's power behind being a community supporter. There's power behind crypto and, and decentraliz decentralization, essentially, in the, in the Web3 primitive, right? And... What is what what does that number kind of mean to you? When you see $24 on the screen, what does that mean to you guys? Well, I see a big crash in the rally token price from a dollar <laughs> forty to like 40 cents, which really hurt our coin. But um, yeah. that's just crypto in general. It goes up and down. Uh, but but to, to be more serious, um that, that price means a lot actually. We we put a lot of work into growing it from 10 cents to where it's at today. And whether it's at 60 or 24, like we consider it very much a success. And the early adopters have had a lot of that. And and what I think more important than the price to me is really to see the adoption of creator coins in general and the, yeah. the people that I've introduced to the system that have stuck around and also commingled with other creators. Like that's one of the other great things about rallies. It's so easy to go from Alley coin to another creator's coin. And with the rally dividends, a lot of people will take that and try out a new creator and, and get some of their benefits. So the for me, that's what's more important is that all these people that have joined from Alley Stream, whereas in 2017, when we tried to get them to do that, it was like impossible. It was pulling teeth just to get somebody yeah. to like make an Ethereum wallet. Absolutely. And yeah, thank you for the kind words, by the way. That was really nice of you to say. Um, 
you know, I, I definitely think that there are a lot of great communities on the Rally platform, and I'm sure there will be other, you know, creator economy platforms that do well, uh, you know, as well. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of the the price, like, I don't know, it's it's kind of crazy to to wrap my head around just because it's it's my name, you know, and it, right. it's, it's going to uh, grow far beyond just about me. I mean, that's our plan, right? You know, it's it's. Um, it's an, an ecosystem and economy that we're, you know, starting with me and Mason and, you know, but I'm hoping that it gets to a point to where, you know, like you said, in, in terms of a DAO, you know, it becomes this thing that is so community based where even if it has the name Ali, you know, it goes far beyond just, just me, because honestly, that, that concept kind of freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> if I'm being completely honest. Um, it is kind of an issue with creator coins where, yeah. you know, like creators want to retire at some point in their lives. You know, yeah, maybe that's yeah. 20, 30 years from now, but a lot of the, the great crypto projects I think are going to exist beyond their founders. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and I wonder if that can be the same for some of these social tokens. Yeah. I think the perfect example of this to like, look at more, I guess, uh, modern day examples is. You have Queen, the band that had its cult following, right? Sure. And then yep. Queen, Freddie Mercury passed away. Maybe Queen has, uh, what, what's that singer? Adam from American Adam Idol, Denver. right? Yep. That like replaces him and does like tribute shows. Sure. And you have the occasional members, but you have the Queen cult, you know, that yep. go, they watch the movies, you know, they engage in the memorabilia, they still stream the music. And from those who stream on Spotify, you have more of the passive uh, engagers, right? And then you have the more active ones that, dress up, go to the tribute bands, do all this really cool stuff. And the brand of Queen has outlived. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's a legacy now. Right. And I think that's the end goal for, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Like that was my yeah, next question know, to you. Well that's, said. that's like the end goal of Ali. Right. Yep. Right. Is that how you kind of see it? Okay. I love that you made the queen analogy. We love queens. So yeah. that's, really, that's really cool. <laughs> if we could have that kind of legacy, that would be amazing. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I love it. I love it. Okay. Uh, a final question to you because you already touched upon it. It's something I ask everybody because the reality of, of social tokens is, well, you're creating a human stock market, a community stock market, essentially. Right. And it, it will come to a point where you where you'll have the companies like Robinhood that gamify stocks, options, mm -hmm. and trading, and you'll have scenarios where creators, I imagine, will come to points where you'll have the the GameStop uh, short squeeze, you know, and in the Doge short squeeze. And how do you imagine that kind of one from a point of view of like taking effect when you have millions of creators all publicly traded, mm -hmm. everybody's speculating. You have you have more of the laggers adopting trading. How do you imagine this world kind of manifesting down the line? Because we've never had a scenario where we were able to invest directly in a creator person in a community. We've only yeah. been able to invest in stocks, right? And unless, like, and I'm talking from a public point of view, like if it was from a private investment, you could do it, right? From a public point of view, this is the first time that we're actually able to do something like this. Um, how do you guys see this manifesting down the line, five, 10 years from now? And even more so, right now we attribute influence to the number of followers you have, right? Mm -hmm. Across YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Now people are gonna be launching themselves in the forms of, of tokens. Will we start attributing influence based off what your token's trading at? For example, Justin Bieber's trading at $100, Taylor Swift mm -hmm. is trading at $30, Justin Bieber's more influential than Taylor Swift and vice versa. So two very, very like big questions tackle them however you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, oh, I do think that that probably is what is going to happen in that this will be the next evolution of the influencer space. Um, I will say that uh, the concept of like investing in a person, I, in theory, like in theory, yes, I believe in that. If you find someone when they're small or like their price of their creator coin is, is low. And you're like, wow, this person's a really good creator. I can totally see them um, getting big someday. I actually like, I loved my bands in high school and I like found a lot of bands that wound up being way bigger than, than when I found them. And I was like, man, I wish I could have bought stock in this bands. Like I would have made bank. So there's actually like, I had this concept as a teenager and mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, this is a cool thing, but 
the thing that I wanted to, the concept that I want to drive home is that it's, it should be first and foremost, a way to participate in the economy that the creator is making. You know, it goes beyond just, you know, investing and speculating. And if someone's uh, coin will go up and down and it's more about like, how can I use the coin that this creator um, has started? And I think that's important because I, you know, I don't know how rational it is, but there is a part of me that gets kind of scared of that landscape. Um, it sort of seems like a Black Mirror episode, if I'm being completely honest. Like, you know, they had one about like followers and stuff like that. And, you know, you're um, going about life in terms of like how what's your score? What's your rating? That kind of thing. And so having like a dollar amount just specifically attached to to my name is is kind of um kind of weird. But I feel like it, if as long as I can be providing services, um, products and things that just go beyond me as a person, I think that's the sweet spot. Um, Mason, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, just on the on the topic of like, does somebody's coin price make them more influential? I think it's going to be a factor. Um, but I don't think there's ever one factor that makes somebody more influential than somebody else. There's going to be all these like the connections that they have to other influential people, um, like how the strength of their following. But I do think, yeah, if you've got more money in your token, you know, it's not just that more people have thrown money at you, but it's also that you have more money to play with. So you can go do more things than a, a smaller creator might, but it's all varying degrees. And it's just one of many factors. Um, and then in terms of like, what does the landscape look like in five to 10 years? Um, I think it's, it's very much like what you're saying, where you're going to slowly see a, a larger and larger percentage of creators having their own coin to the point where it almost feels like almost every creator has their own mm -hmm. coin. I think at some point it gets there. Maybe that's 10 years from now. Maybe it's two years from now. I don't really know the speed of that adoption. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of speculation and they're definitely going to come out with financial instruments to allow people to leverage their positions and short positions. And I think there's going to be all sorts of liquidity pools and you're going to be able to use your creator coins as collateral at some point. Um, it might depend on, you know, the, the weaker coins you probably can't do that with because it's too volatile, but with the stronger coins, people will probably lend against those. So yeah, over time, I think like in just crypto in general, I think it's going to be hundreds of coins and the creator coins are going to be a piece of that whole pie. And it's all going to be this interconnected web of financial activity and it'll be, it, it's fun. Like it's hard. It's so hard to predict because it's going to, it's going to just be like more economic activity than we could even imagine right now. I like the idea of it being more fun than anything. Like I, I can see the, uh, every, you know, creator having their own coin, but again, it's a method of participation, you know, and support, you know, like if you enjoy someone's content, um, you throw them a tip, right? You know, like you, you appreciate them and being a part of their community in this way, I think could be something that's really uh, special and one of the coolest uh, forms or one of the coolest ways to use cryptocurrency and, and blockchain blockchain technology. So, and nothing makes you root for a creator like owning some of their coin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people will see a creator get really big and they're, you know, the, the jealousy comes out in them and they're like, oh, that person doesn't deserve it. But if you buy just like a couple right. of their coins, you're like, yeah, they deserve it. I love them. Go, yeah. go make me some more money. And, and, <laughs> I know that can be negative too. Like if the coin goes down in price, yeah, you might yeah. hold that against the creator. But I, I think like Ali said, if you're doing it with the mentality of, I just want this to be a fun investment that I can make. And if it does well, then great. And if it doesn't, at least I know I supported this creator. Mm -hmm. Like that's the perfect way to approach it. And I think if most of the people approach it that way, it's going to be a really great time for almost everybody. Also what people can do, you know, when we launched Ali, we didn't really think, we just put the name Ali, like we called it Ali coin, but there are definitely a lot of creators who are not putting their name at, you know, they're, they're a creator that creates, um, give me an example. Well, like, okay, Jaws, know, for instance, yeah. actually, not only did he not use his stage name Jaws, but he used BTX, which is his bite this label. So, mm -hmm. um, his coin's not even his stage name. It's, it's something else entirely. And that's because he wants it to be like, getting to own part of this new type of label that's run by a cryptocurrency and the cryptocurrency holders can vote on which songs the label should add. And like that to me is just an awesome social concept that, that I own some of that coin because I think like, I really believe in what he's creating there.
Yeah. So it's not just mm -hmm. going to be Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber coin. It's going to be right. creators, of, you know, starting their own businesses and attaching currencies to that. I, um, I think the perfect example of that is Whale Shark, uh, probably the most successful social token project to date. Uh, have you guys heard of Whale Shark? I actually have not. No. So Whale Shark is part whale, part shark. Okay. He's anonymous. He's anonymous character, uh, personality online that he's been in the space for years, but he really got his, his name to fame by his NFT portfolio and basically making big bets on NFT artists and buying large amounts of, uh, of digital art. Okay. And what he did, he then created the whale community. Okay. Where it's a, it's a, it's a vault of these tokenized assets that's pegged to his social token, indirectly pegged to his social token, but there's some value relationship between that. Um, and people love whale, like people love whale. And he took it to the extent where he now created a clothing brand called 1337, which is a social token within itself that targets the gaming community, okay? Yeah. And, and creates meta wear that also translates into physical wear. So the whole bet that he's making is people are gonna be so heavily invested into the metaverse that they're also gonna wanna represent what they wear online in person. So you can purchase awesome. your clothing, right? Through digital currencies, through the currency 1337. And he also has his BitCloud, right? So he has three different social tokens and, and the BitCloud is the whale BitCloud that's also performing exceptionally well. So he's three different social tokens, uh, each doing and working their magic. And like you said, probably these things, a lot of them will be tied to the creator's name, like Ali, but, mm -hmm it should be getting to a point where creators are thinking about building brands that extend beyond them, where there's a common like vision, mission, that community and a large amount of people, even a small amount of people, right? Depends how, how you wanna build this network that align with and that grow that from there on, that extend beyond you. Um, so a an anonymous success in cryptocurrency, is this Satoshi's uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> creator <of> coin? <laughs> Not you. Is Bitcoin Satoshi's uh, social token? Is yes. what you're saying. <laughs> well, that's, exactly. a, that's a joke in our friend group sometimes. Like Cardano is just like a big social token for Charles Hoskinson. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love that. I love that. Guys. But, yeah, I was go, to say, it was really yeah. a thing. It was yeah. just as a an interesting, you know, when we started Alleycoin, I was reading The Internet of Money by Andreas Antonopoulos. And in that book, you know, he just talked about how there were going to be creator coins, Bob Coin and Sue Ann Coin or whatever. Um, and he was talking about that in what, 2014 or 2015, whenever he wrote that uh, talk. And yeah. It was just crazy to me because I was reading that book and as we were starting Alleycoin, it was coming to fruition. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So, um, yeah, I just really think that creator economies, creator coins, the next evolution of the influencer space, honestly. I love it, guys. That's a that's a perfect place to end off. Ali, Mason, more power to you. Uh, thank you for being on. And I hope to have you on again when your community is more developed, more success, more exposure. Uh, so cheers. Thanks for being on. Thanks for, Thanks having, for us. having us. Of course.